Chapter Thirty Three, Part Four of A Short History of Scotland by Andrew Lang, read for LibriVox.org into the public domain. Chapter Thirty Three, The Last Jacobite Rising, Part Four. A great mistake was made next day if Loch Gary, who commanded the Macdonalds of Glengarry, and Maxwell of Kirkconnell are correct in saying that Lord George insisted on placing his Athol men on the right wing. The Macdonalds had an old claim to the right wing, but as far as research enlightens us their failure on this fatal day was not due to jealous anger. The battle might have been avoided, but to retreat was to lose Inverness and all chance of supplies. On the highland right was the water of Narn, and they were guarded by a wall which the Campbells pulled down, enabling Cumberland's cavalry to take them in flank. Cumberland had about nine thousand men, including the Campbells. Charles, according to his muster-master, had five thousand. Of horse he had but a handful. The battle began with an artillery duel, during which the clans lost heavily, while their few guns were useless, and their right flank was exposed by the breaking down of the protecting wall. After some unexplained and dangerous delay, Lord George gave the word to charge, in face of a blinding tempest of sleet, and himself went in, as did Lochiel, Claymore in hand. But though the order was conveyed by Kerr of Graydon first to the Macdonalds on the left, as they had to charge over a wider space of ground, the Camerons, Clan Chatton, and Maclean's came first to the shock. Nothing could be more desperate than their attack, or more properly received, says Whiteford. The assailants were infilleted by Wolfe's regiment, which moved up and took position at right angles, like the 52nd on the flank of the last charge of the French guard at Waterloo. The Highland right broke through Barrel's regiment, swept over the guns, and died on the bayonets of the second line. They had thrown down their muskets after one fire, and, says Cumberland, stood and threw stones for at least a minute or two before their total rout began. Probably the fall of Lochiel, who was wounded and carried out of action, determined the flight. Meanwhile the left, the Macdonalds, menaced on the flank by cavalry, were plied at a hundred yards by grape. They saw their leaders, the gallant Keppoch and Macdonald of Scothouse, with many others, fall under the grape-shot. They saw the right wing broken, and they did not come to the shock. If we may believe four sworn witnesses in a court of justice, July twenty fourth, seventeen fifty two, whose testimony was accepted as the basis of a judicial discreet, January tenth, seventeen fifty six, Keppoch was wounded while giving his orders to some of his men not to outrun the line in advancing, and was shot dead as a friend was supporting him. When all retreated, they passed the dead body of Keppoch. The tradition constantly given in various forms that Keppoch charged alone deserted by the children of his clan, is worthless if sworn evidence may be trusted. As for the unhappy Charles, by the evidence of Sir Robert Strange, who was with him, he had ridden along the line to the right animating the soldiers, and endeavouring to rally the soldiers who, annoyed by the enemy's fire, were beginning to quit the field. He was got off the field when the men in general were betaking themselves precipitately to flight, nor was there any possibility of their being rallied. York, an English officer, says that the prince did not leave the field till after the retreat of the second line. So far the prince's conduct was honourable and worthy of his name. But presently, on the advice of his Irish entourage, Sullivan and Sheridan, who always suggested suspicions, and doubtless not forgetting the great price on his head, he took his own way towards the west coast in place of joining Lord George and the remnant with him at Ruthven and Badenoch. On April 26 he sailed from Borodale in a boat, and began that course of wanderings and hairbreadth escapes in which only the loyalty of Highland hearts enabled him at last to escape the ships that watched the isles and troops that netted the hills. Some years later, General Wolfe, when residing at Inverness, reviewed the occurrences and made up his mind that the battle had been a dangerous risk for Cumberland, while the pursuit, though ruthlessly cruel, was inefficient. Despite Cumberland's insistent orders to give no quarter, orders justified by the absolutely false pretext that Prince Charles had set the example, Lotgarry reported that the army had not lost more than a thousand men. Fire and sword and torture, the destruction of tilled lands, and even of the shellfish on the shore, did not break the spirit of the Highlanders. Many bands held out in arms, and Lotgarry was only prevented by the prince's command from laying an ambush for Cumberland. The Campbells and the Macleods under the recreant chief, the Whig Macdonalds under Sir Alexander of Sleet, ravaged the lands of the Jacobite clansmen, but the spies of Abermarle, who now commanded in Scotland, reported the Macleans, 
the Grants of Glenmoriston, with the Macphersons, Glengarry's men, and Lochiel's Camerons, as all eager to do it again, if France would only help. But France was helpless, and when Lochiel sailed for France with the prince, only Cluny remained, hunted like a partridge in the mountains, to keep up the spirit of the cause. Old Lovett met a long-deserved death by the executioner's axe, though it needed the evidence of Murray of Broughton, turned informer, to convict that fox. Kilmarnock and Balmerino were also executed. The good and brave Duke of Perth died on his way to France. The aged Tilliburdine in the tower. Many gallant gentlemen were hanged. Lord George escaped, and is the ancestor of the present Duke of Athol. Many gentlemen took French service. Others fought in other alien armies. Three or four in the highlands or abroad took the wages of spies upon the prince. The thirty thousand pounds of French gold, buried near Loch Arcaig, caused endless feuds, kinsmen denouncing kinsmen. The secrets of the years 1746 to 1760 are to be sought in the Cumberland and Stuart manuscripts in Windsor Castle and the Record Office. Legislation intended to scotch the snake of Jacobitism began with religious persecution. The Episcopalian clergy had no reason to love triumphant Presbyterianism, and actively or in sympathy were favorers of the exiled dynasty. Episcopalian chapels, sometimes mere rooms in private houses, were burned, or their humble furniture was destroyed. All Episcopalian ministers were bidden to take the oath and pray for King George by September 1746, or suffer for the second offense, transportation for life to the American colonies. Later, the orders conferred by Scottish bishops were of made of no avail. Only with great difficulty and danger could parents obtain the right of baptism for their children. Very little is said in our histories about the sufferings of the Episcopalians when it was their turn to be under the harrow. They were not violent. They murdered no moderator of the General Assembly. Other measures were the Disarming Act, the prohibition to wear the Highland dress, and the abolition of hereditable jurisdictions, and the chief's right to call out his clansmen in arms. Compensation in money was paid, from twenty-one thousand pounds to the Duke of Argyle, to thirteen pounds, six shillings, eightpence, to the clerks of the register of Aberbrothock. The whole sum was one hundred and fifty-two thousand, two hundred thirty-seven pounds, fifteen shillings, fourpence. In 1754 an act annexed the forfeited estates of the Jacobites, who had been out, or many of them, inalienably to the crown. The estates were restored in 1784. Meanwhile, the profits were to be used for the improvement of the highlands. If submissive tenants received better terms and larger leases than of old, Jacobite tenants were evicted for not being punctual with rent. Therefore, on May 14, 1752, some person unknown shot Campbell of Glenure, who was about evicting tenants on the lands of Lochiel and Stuart of Ardshiel and Appen. Campbell rode down from Fort William to Balachulish Ferry, and when he had crossed it said, I am safe now I am out of my mother's country. But as he drove along the old road through the woods of Lettermore, perhaps a mile and a half south of Balachulish House, the fatal shot was fired. For this crime James Stewart of the Glens was tried by a Campbell jury at Inverary, with the Duke on the bench, and was of course convicted, and hanged on the top of a knoll of Balachulish Ferry. James was innocent, but Alan Breck Stewart was certainly an accomplice of the man with the gun, which, by the way, was the property neither of James Stewart nor of Stewart of Fannis Clark. The murderer was anxious to save James by avowing the deed, but his kinsfolk, saying, They will only hang both James and you, bound him hand and foot and locked him up in the kitchen on the day of James's execution. Alan lay for some weeks at the house of a kinsman in Rannoch, and escaped to France, where he had a fight with James Moore MacGregor, then a spy in the service of the Duke of Newcastle. The murder of the Red Fox caused all the more excitement, and is all the better remembered in Lochaber and Glencoe, because agrarian violence in revenge for eviction has scarcely another example in the history of the Highlands. End of chapter 33 Read by Sibella Denton For more free audiobooks or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org Conclusion of A Short History of Scotland by Andrew Lang Read for LibriVox.org into the public domain. Conclusion Space does not permit an account of the assimilation of Scotland to England in the years between the forty-five and our own time. Moreover, 
the history of this age cannot well be written without a dangerously close approach to many burning questions of our day. The history of the Highlands, from 1752 to the emigrations witnessed by Dr. Johnson, 1760 to 1780, and of the later evictions in the interest of sheep farms and deer forests, has never been studied as it ought to be in the rich manuscript materials which are easily accessible. The great literary renaissance of Scotland, from 1745 to the death of Sir Walter Scott, the years of Hume, a pioneer in philosophy and in history, and of the Reverend Principal Robertson, with him and Hume, Gibbon professed, very modestly, that he did not rank, the times of Adam Smith, of Burns, and of Sir Walter, not to speak of the Reverend John Home, that foremost tragic poet, may be studied in many a history of literature. According to Voltaire, Scotland led the world in all studies, from metaphysics to gardening. We think of Watt and add engineering. The brief and inglorious administration of the Earl of Bute at once gave openings in the public service to Scots of ability, and excited that English hatred of those northern rivals which glows in Churchill's satires, while this English jealousy aroused that Scottish hatred of England, which is the one passion that disturbs the placid letters of David Hume. The later alliance of Pitt with Henry Dundas made Dundas far more powerful than any secretary for Scotland had been since Lauderdale, and confirmed the connection of Scotland with the services in India. But politically, Scotland, till the Reform Bill, had scarcely a recognizable existence. The electorate was tiny, and great landholders controlled the votes, whether genuine or created by legal fiction, faggot votes. Municipal administration in the late eighteenth and early nineteenth centuries was terribly corrupt, and reform was demanded, but the French Revolution, producing associations of friends of the people, who were persecuted and grievously punished in trials for sedition, did not afford a fortunate moment for peaceful reforms. But early in the nineteenth century Geoffrey, editor of the Edinburgh Review, made it the organ of liberalism, and no less potent in England than in Scotland, while Scott, on the Tory side, led a following of Scottish penmen across the border in the surface of the Quarterly Review. With Blackwood's Magazine, and Wilson, Hogg, and Lockhart, with Geoffrey and the Edinburgh, the Scottish metropolis almost rivaled London as a literary capital. About 1818 Lockhart recognized the superiority of the Whig wits in literature, but against them all Scott is a more than sufficient set-off. The years of stress between Waterloo, 1815, and the Reform Bill, 1832, made radicalism, fostered by economic causes, the enormous commercial and industrial growth, and the unequal distribution of its rewards, perhaps even more pronounced north than south of the Tweed. In 1820 the radical war led to actual encounters between the yeomanry and the people. The ruffianism of the Tory paper The Beacon caused one fatal duel, and was within an inch of leading to another, in which a person of the very highest consequence would have gone on the sod. For the Reform Bill the mass of Scottish opinion, so long not really represented at all, was as eager as for the Covenant. So triumphant was the first Whig or radical majority under the new system, that Geoffrey, the Whig pontiff, perceived that the real struggle was to be between property and no property, between capital and socialism. This circumstance has always been perfectly clear to Scott and the Tories. The watchword of the eighteenth century in literature, religion, and politics had been no enthusiasm. But throughout the century, since 1740, enthusiasm, the return to nature, had gradually conquered till the rise of the Romantic school with Coleridge and Scott. In religion the enthusiastic movement of the Wesleys had altered the face of the church in England, while in Scotland the moderates had lost position, and zeal or enthusiasm pervaded the kirk. The question of lay patronage of livings had passed through many phases since Knox wrote, It pertaineth to the people, and to every several congregation, to elect their minister. In 1833, immediately after the passing of the Reform Bill, the return to the primitive Knoxian rule was advocated by the evangelical, or high-flying opponents of the moderates. Dr. Chalmers, a most eloquent person, whom Scott regarded as truly a man of genius, was the leader of the movement. The Veto Act, by which the votes of a majority of heads of families were to be fatal to the claims of a patron's presentee, had been passed by the General Assembly. It was contrary to Queen Anne's Patronage Act of 1711, a measure carried, contrary to Harley's policy, 
by a coalition of English churchmen and Scottish Jacobite members of Parliament. The rejection, under the Veto Act, of a presentee by the Church of Octorator was declared illegal by the Court of Session and the judges in the House of Lords, May 1839. The Strathbogi in Borglio, with two presbyteries, one taking its orders from the Court of Session, the other from the General Assembly, 1837 to 1841, brought the Assembly into direct conflict with the law of the land. Dr. Chalmers would not allow the spiritual claims of the Kirk to be suppressed by the State. King Christ's crown honors were once more in question. On May 18, 1843, the followers of the principals of Knox and Andrew Melville marched out of the assembly into Tanfield Hall, and made Dr. Chalmers moderator, and themselves the Free Church of Scotland. In 1847 the hitherto separated synods of various dissenting bodies came together as united Presbyterians, and in 1902 they united with the Free Church as the United Free Church, while a small minority, mainly Highland, of the former Free Church, now retains that title, and apparently represents Knoxian ideals. Thus the Knoxian ideals have modified, even to this day, the ecclesiastical life of Scotland, while the Church of James I, never by persecution extinguished, nec tamen consumbatur, has continued to exist and develop, perhaps more in consequence of love of the liturgy than from any other cause. Meanwhile, and not least in the United Free Church, extreme tenacity of dogma has yielded place to very advanced biblical criticism, and Knox, could he revisit Scotland with all his old opinions, might not be wholly satisfied by the changes wrought in the course of more than three centuries. The Scottish universities, discouraged and almost destitute of pious benefactors since the end of the sixteenth century, have profited by the increase of wealth and a comparatively recent outburst of generosity. They always provided the cheapest, and now they provide the cheapest and most efficient education that is offered by any homes of learning of medieval foundation. End of Conclusion End of A Short History of Scotland by Andrew Lang Read by Sibella Denton in April 2009 in Carrollton, Georgia For more free audiobooks or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org